Hi, I'm Dave Seaver of Mind Alive. Today, I'm going to talk to you about performance in the zone and how to enhance it with audiovisual entrainment. Performance spans all kinds of things. Uh, lecturing at conferences, for instance, squeezing through a narrow shaft in a cave, uh, climbing, running, all kinds of, of course, athletic events have been often tied to peak performance. When it comes to audiovisual entrainment, when I first developed the uh, digital audiovisual integration device or the, the David system, it was actually for an instructor in performing arts who had heard that flashing lights and pulsing tones could be used to put people into hypnotic trances. And he wanted to use this to help his students overcome stage fright. So the original inception of the David devices that we, of course, manufacture today all came from a peak performance perspective. Now, I love to push myself. I love to peak perform. And one of the things I really like to do is get out into caves and glaciers and things like this and drop into crevices and such. Now, to do that, you must be peak performing on both a physical level and on a mental level. If you get exhausted halfway through an excursion you know, into crevices or climbing through glaciers or things like this, you're going to be in big trouble. The same thing happens if you lose your mental edge going into a crevice or a cave or climbing a cliff wall or something like this. If you lose your mental edge, you two are, are suddenly in big trouble. You must always keep your wits about yourself. So you must peak perform to do this on a physical and on a mental and basically an emotional level as well. So this is just here an example of some of the things I love to do. And here we are at, we're at a glacier in, uh, this is Athabasca Glacier in the Columbia Ice Fields. And you can see that on the left panel here, there's that shaft. And I'm going to drop into that shaft. So when you look at the center one, I'm going down here and here I stopped, oh, I don't know, probably halfway down anyway or so. And I looked up and I took a picture of my, uh, my, my cave buddies up there looking down at me while I was dropping into the crevice. But when you get down there, the reward is absolutely mind-blowing. It's so spectacular. And here I am at the bottom of this crevice and, and the formations and the blue colors. It's this iridescent blue that is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this. And I don't even know if that's the best shot of blue, but certainly a picture cannot do it justice. You have to be there to see it. Uh, the blue is wild and it's amazing and it's breathtaking. Now, when it comes to performance, there's two things that we got to look at. These are two arousal curves, basically. These are what's, these are Yerkes and Dodson from 1908. They developed these arousal curves. And this is really interesting and it applies so much nowadays. Let's take a look here. So first we have this curve with the dashed line and it's high arousal. And what they find is that with this curve here in a high aroused state, yeah, it's really good for focused attention, flashbulb memory of the moment, not necessarily things in the past, but of the moment. You can remember stuff with real clarity. Uh, fear conditioning. This is all your stuff with good, you know, fast, hard physical action, generally speaking. This is tied to flight or fight response in actuality. This is where saving ourselves, either punching the daylights out of an enemy or running like mad and climbing trees or whatever it takes to get away from an enemy or a threat of some sort, typically works very well in a highly aroused state. The downside to being in a highly aroused state, of course, is it can't maintain itself long. You get exhausted quite quickly in this state of mind and you can't sustain it. Take a look now at a more moderate state of arousal. In a moderate state of arousal, which is the solid curve here, the bell curve, this lends itself beautifully to more difficult tasks. And so people would think of difficult tasks, well, as me maybe presenting this lecture driving a car, doing an engineering task, working with your clients, doing thought processes of different sorts, problem solving, uh, things like these. But one of the things that people don't correlate as a difficult cast, because we're probably just so used to doing it, and that is socialization. So far, about 3,000 facial expressions have been documented to date and cataloged. 
And facial expressions, just like verbal intonations and body language, they're all fleeting. They're all quarter second or half second events and they move on. So you must be on top of your game to socialize well. And when you think about society nowadays, where so many people in society are running on that dashed line curve of arousal. And that lends itself to road rage, to poor performance, coming home and yelling at their spouse and kids, a high divorce rate, uh, you know, fighting amongst people. It's really a bad state to be in when you need to socialize. Also, when you're in a highly aroused state, you lack empathy. You lack for ability, you know, forgiveness skills. You lack patience. Uh, a lot of things socially uh, really, really go down the hill when we are in a highly aroused state. And the more society gets hectic and frantic the way it has been, the more socioeconomic issues that we see in society. So typically the way assessments of performance, especially in this case, I'll be looking at sports performance. And the way assessments of sports performance is typically has been done in, over the years is that the coach will look at skill and physiological training. Then they'll take a look at strength, they'll look at your stamina, look at your skill, oxygen consumption. They'll take those measurements and they'll cycle back and they'll adjust the training schedule to bring up more of what they need that might be weak of those different factors. And they, they keep running this process with the intention that you're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger on a physical level and your performance will improve. However, what so many coaches still miss even today is the psychological aspect of entraining. Because if you don't have the psychological aspects in order, you're just not going to put the physiological aspects in order. Psychological aspects include measurements of anxiety, of hopefulness, perception of ability. Also, what's your definition of success? Is your definition of success so out there that you can never meet it and you're destined to fail for sure? Or is it reasonable? It may be your definition is too low there are really no goals to try and achieve. So you must have a proper definition of a success that pushes the person, but is also achievable. And you look at that end of things, you go back to your psychological training program, you modify it, and then you do your measurements again of anxiety, hopefulness, perception, and ability, and your definition, and how are you meeting that definition? And that will get you on the edge of psychological performance. Now, this is a brain here that is in top-down performing state. And this is what you want to be in, of course, when you're trying to perform. You need top-down regulation of what is going on in the mind. And here we see the prefrontal cortex, and it's regulating the emotional centers of the brain in particular, which would include the, uh, the, the whole limbic system. And that, in turn, regulates the, the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, it regulates dopamine, regulates norepinephrine, serotonin levels, and so on are all regulated and when we have a top-down approach, and they're regulated appropriately to govern our arousal, appropriately for the uh, tasks at hand and the events we're trying to achieve. So as long as we have that, we're going to stay in a positive attitude. We're going to be doing the psychological part of our game. We're going to be doing the physiological part of our game, and we'll be doing it in a manner of excellence and mastery and control. And we'll keep monitoring our gains and our improvements. We'll keep working on it. We'll have good behavior. We'll eat good diets. Everything will be all working around the top-down control where everything will be in alignment with our intentions and our actions. However, when we start to lose that top-down control, we get into trouble. When we start getting into fear-based behavior, the amygdala starts to hijack the process. And in the process, it also hijacks other parts of the brain, such as the nucleus accumbens, the dopamine circuits from the ventral tegmental area, which also are involved in motivation, reward, also addiction as well, if a person should go down that route. Uh, but hopefully a person will use it for their motivation and reward every time they can do well with their tasks and with their performance. However, when the emotional system starts to hijack the top-down approach, in other words, it's hijacking the prefrontal cortex where executive decisions are being made, logic is 
carried out in the brain and the emotions are under control. So when the emotional side starts to hijack the thinking, processing, reasoning, say executive decision making side, then we get into serious trouble, of course. And one of the nasty things about the uh, emotional system or the limbic system in control is the amygdala itself. We can see here that the amygdala is wired back. It has outputs that feed into the prefrontal cortex to make the prefrontal cortex think on its terms. Now, from a fear perspective, in terms of immediate protection of yourself and be keeping yourself safe and alive, this system works. In any other type of scenario, the system really fails in all kinds of ways. So what we're looking at here is a performer is going into fear. And in the process, they're starting to hijack the prefrontal cortex to think on those terms. Here's an example. Let's say you live in a home Normally, you have other people living with you, or where it could be a spouse or a roommate or kids or something like this. But tonight, whatever reason, everyone's gone, and so you're home all alone. So you're a little extra on edge and on guard because you're on alone and you're more vulnerable to potential threats or break and enters and things like this if you're alone. So anyway, you go to bed. You're laying in bed and you're, you're starting to fall asleep. Your prefrontal cortex is kind of letting its control go and you hear a sound. And the amygdala immediately jumps to action. Oh my God, we heard a sound. Someone breaking into the house. What could it be? And your prefrontal cortex, of course, is going to wake up because the amygdala is going to wake it up with a little shot of adrenaline or noradrenaline for the brain. And it's going to go, I don't know, uh, couldn't be. Now I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure it's just a sound but the amygdala gets it to think on its terms. So it goes, hey, hey, I don't think it's just a sound. I think there's somebody intruding into our house. And after a while, your amygdala, your prefrontal cortex starts to believe it. And now you're getting really pumped up on it. Cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline. And now, of course, you're wide awake and your attention is very focused. Your hearing becomes very sharp. Now you're really, really concerned that someone is breaking into your house and either you'll You'll, you'll phone 911 or you'll get up and you'll start looking around and take action on your own accord and see if anyone's in the house. In this case, yeah, you do that and there's absolutely no one in there. It was all hype that your amygdala generated into your prefrontal cortex because it was attempting to save you from a potential threat, which in this case absolutely did not exist. But that's what it does. And on, from a fear perspective, it can really play out bad things when we're trying to uh, you know, improve our performance. So these are positive and negative performance cycles. And the amygdala, of course, plays out in these cycles, and so does the prefrontal cortex. Top-down prefrontal cortex control, that's a positive performance cycle. You have a positive self-image, and you've probably built this self-image with your coach and so on, based on your abilities at that time. And it's all good. And in the process, you have an attitude. You have positive expectations. Your behavior is really good. Your performance is good. They measure all this cycle. You go through the cycle. You reassess your self-image. Maybe you're slowly trying to get better and better and better. Maybe uh, somewhere in the world, whatever your uh, event is that you're uh, excelling at, maybe your 50th place in the world and you want to be first. Whether it's playing tennis or whether it's uh, downhill skiing or skating or swimming or any one of hundreds of events and uh, activities that you could be involved in, you maintain that positive self-image, you set reasonable goals, you meet the goal, you have a positive attitude, you're excited, you get rewarded with dopamine in your nucleus accumbens, the limbic system stays calm on the fear side, at least, and, uh, and the reward system is basically running, which keeps your expectations positive, your behavior is good, your performance is good, your self-image is good, you reassess, now we can raise the bar a little higher. You go through again, through all this process, and then you meet your objectives with a little higher bar, and you're, now you're no longer maybe 50th place in the world, but now you're working down to 45th and then 40th and 35th and 30th as you slowly climb the ladder of success and maintain that positive cycle. However, many athletes fall into a negative performance cycle 
And in my opinion, the mental constructs that are involved in falling into a, a negative performance cycle often have to, have to be involved with fear-based performance. And the way athletes really fall into fear-based performance is when they put their assessment of their entire persona themselves, I'm a failure, I'm a winner, and they put that on them, whether or not they achieve the event, win or fail the event, uh, rather than just realizing that they could be a good person who simply failed an event, they make this irrational jump that I failed the event, therefore I'm a terrible person. And in the process, they run into all sorts of trouble. So let's say we've got an athlete here, and this athlete is pretty good. And on the local level, nobody can beat this athlete. So this athlete's in a positive performance cycle. Wins every game, doesn't have any worries. This person knows he's going to do well and keeps training and working out and so on and feels great about himself and is all, you know, uh, high on life and everything else. And then he gets into the region, uh, let's say the, the state or the provincial tryouts. And there are some tougher contenders now that this person has to go against. But this person is looking at the stats on everyone and still got better stats than everyone else, so doesn't worry. Continues to work out, stays positive, eats properly, doesn't go out and party, and maintains that positive performance cycle and wins. And then now the person gets into the regional games in this case, let's say. And now this person's getting nervous because there are some contenders now who are in the regionals who have better stats than this person. And this person now is afraid that they're going to fail. And because they tie their whole persona to winning or failing, and they don't want to fail, they subconsciously sabotage themselves so they have an out. So they then don't have to attack their ego. Because there's nothing worse than someone who's extremely self-critical, who gives it their absolute all, and then fails. Now they're just going to beat themselves up. They're going to be mad at the world. They're going to be screaming and yelling at everybody. They're going to break relationships. They're just going to turn into terrible people because now they're going to be in a state of fear. And in that state of fear, people don't do well. I mean, people are never nice when we're in a state of fear. Uh, we don't perform at all well, and we're just awful people in general when we're in a fear state. And we can't engage socially as well. So we end up saying rude or mean things to our family, our friends, our uh, you know, mates or spouses or children, and we just become real unnice people. And that happens. So what they'll do then, these people who want to avoid this negative performance cycle, is let's say they're at this state now where they really have to perform 110% to win and they can do it, but they're afraid that they're gonna lose and then they're gonna hate themselves and the world. So to avoid self-rejection, they call up a few buddies, they go out to the bar, they have a few beer that night, stay up a little bit too late, have a few too many drinks. In the morning, they're a little bit hungover, their electrolytes are off, of course, other things are not the best. And when they get into the event, well, they don't win the event. They come pretty good still, but they don't win the event and they probably don't do as well as they normally would just in training alone. But they have an out and they can go back and say, you know, I could have cleaned that guy's clock. Oh yeah, I was good. But you know, silly me, ha ha ha. I went out and partied the night before. And so I didn't do the best that day, but I could have clobbered that guy. Oh yeah, no trouble at all. So they end up building all kinds of stories of almosts. I almost did this, I almost did that, I almost won. And you start to see patterns with these types of people where they have long histories of, I almost did this, I was almost an astronaut, I was almost the best at something, you know, and, and it goes on and on and on. I almost invented something. I, I tell you, I see engineers who are in a negative performance cycle, well, they're, they're self-critical, and they are afraid, of course, that they give it their all, if the product that they've designed or the software algorithm that they've developed, if it isn't accepted by the world, then they're just going to be really, really uh, ticked off about it and upset and be self-blaming and everything else. So they avoid that. And what they'll do is they will spend two years designing the best product, let's say, or the best uh, software algorithm or app or something like this, and then when they're 95% done, they'll completely sabotage uh, the remaining 
Now, if they're working on their own, it's, I guess it's not so bad. They just hurt themselves. But if they're in a team, they start to take the entire team down. And then there's huge amounts of frustration and upset and loss for all the other people who are dragged down with this. And I've seen this pattern happen. I've seen engineers say, put two years of their lives into something and then sabotage that last 5% and never get the product out. But if you sit down and have a drink with them, man, have they got stories of almost, I almost invented this, I almost invented that. I almost did the world's greatest, you know, something or other, but they never did. So all these almost achievements, uh, you must be very careful in getting into a team environment with people who have a lot of weight put on themselves in their entirety in their performance uh, because uh, they will go into a negative performance cycle when the going gets tough. One of the things that I do with performers who put, uh, who value their entire persona on their winning or failing an event is I have to get them to break that pattern. So we will talk about someone in their life that they just love and adore and really respect and just think the most of. And it could be a friend, it could be an aunt or an uncle, maybe a, a spouse or a sibling, uh, maybe a professor or something at college or a teacher, or who knows. But anyway, so you can tell me about that person. What is it about that person that you adore so much? And they go, well, that person was just caring, you know, they're supportive, they're sacrificing, they're passionate, they're spontaneous, they're nurturing, they're self-aware, they're honest, ethical, they're fun, uh, they're helpful, they're fit, they're, they're clean living, they're good listeners. They have this sort of impeccable personality or qualities of themselves. They're loving, they're loyal, hardworking, faithful, they're giving, they're dependable, I could add, they're playful. You know, they have all these beautiful attributes that are really the real attributes of human, of humanity. These are attributes of humanity. And they were developed when we lived in the tribal system. And for a million years, humans lived in a tribal system that consisted mostly of extended family and some friends and maybe some strays who came into our tribe. And these attributes of humanity were absolutely essential for the survival of the tribe. You had to have these things. And so when they explain this about this person in their life who they adore, I go, well, hang on, you never said that person was an amazing engineer or an amazing mathematician or an amazing golfer or an amazing swimmer or an amazing racer or something like this. You just listed all the things that are, make a human wonderful from a social perspective and a humanitarian perspective. You never got into their skill set. Isn't that interesting? So if you start to tie in all these things of humanity and, and you sacrifice those every time you lose an event, you're not a nice person. In fact, you're, you're gonna be a terrible person every time you lose an event. So if I can get them to wrap their heads around, they're already, you know, 100% a good human being if they have these attributes. And losing these attributes is serious. Yeah, you can lose an event, but keep these attributes and you're still a great human being. But if you drag these attributes down with you every time you lose an event and you just become a real awful person, that's, that's a huge loss. And if I can get the athlete to wrap their head around this, then, their performance actually improves significantly. Now, sometimes the athlete has been, in a, has been in an awful person for a long time because they're in fear so much. So we, have, we can't just say, think of a time when you were nice. We have to say, think of a time kind of like when you were not in fear. And when you're not in fear, you probably had all these attributes. And think about that. And then think about a time when you were in fear and you lost all your attributes and you were no longer a nice person. And sometimes you have to really pick the scene to try to find it because they don't have a lot of good things they can say about themselves at that point in time. But anyway, if you can get them to find that good things about themselves, certainly when they're not in fear, 
and nurture that, get them to wrap their heads around this being really important, you will see an improvement in their behavior and you'll see an improvement in their skill sets and abilities. Now, another type of threat, which I'm just gonna to touch on here, I'm not gonna get into very much detail, and this is a stereotype threat. Now, most of the, the people I work with, the peak performers, don't have concerns about a stereotype threat, uh, but you may come across them. And a stereotype threat, so negative stereotypes impose a burden on many people and the, who think that others around them view them as inferior. And this goes on uh, all the time, in, in subtle ways at least. Women worry they do poorer at math than men. White athletes fear they will be poorer in sports than black athletes. Black students feel they will do poorer in academics than white students. Indicating race or gender on a performance test predetermines the performance outcome. And it's not because of the race or gender, it's because of what they've assumed about themselves because of their race or gender. And that is something that we have to really consider and check on and make sure that they don't have these stereotypical views of themselves. Another example, lower st income students feel they won't measure up to wealthy students. Uh, anyway, uh, the more motivated to succeed, the more fearing and anxiety that develops, which impairs working memory and it reduces expectations of success. So, so odds are you're not going to really come across this too much um, from a sports perspective, but be aware that it can exist. Paralysis by analysis is a really big issue. I don't think it's much of an issue in a very action-packed sport where high arousal is really uh, the key here. If you're a soccer player and you're running like mad up and down that field, knowing exactly when to judge where that ball is going to be, I mean, that's certainly important. But what's important is probably even more important is your ability to move fast and be in zone and be where you need to be when you have to be there and just have good physical strength and just bat that ball and get it into the goal. And that typically requires high arousal. And paralysis by analysis is not such an issue. However, where paralysis by analysis really starts to, to play out in a destructive way, is in a type of a game where you have too much time to think. Now, activities that, where you can have too much time to think are things such as like uh, playing chess, playing pool. Golf is notorious for this, and all kinds of golfers uh, you know, do really poor halfway through the game after they've had a couple of bad shots, and then they start getting paralyzed by overanalyzing things. In the process, they typically tense up, their breathing goes off, they start to fatigue their fast twitch muscle, which they, a golfer definitely needs for a fast swing. And they start to make judgment errors because they start to get impulsive. And so both mentally, emotionally, and physically, they start to go down and their performance is eroded and then they don't do well. Sleep is another big issue. And so many athletes have very distorted views on uh, how well they sleep because they never really assess it properly. Nowadays, there are more gadgets you can buy, you know, sleep measuring watches and uh, other uh, biometric devices that can measure your sleep to a fair degree and help us or help the athlete in this case or help the performer be more objective with their assessments of their own sleep. But typically, college students Athletes think they are getting one to two hours more sleep than actual sleep. In this case, you see 7.8 hours on average reported versus 6.6 .6 hours in actual sleep time. Elite athletes have an average sleep efficiency of about 80%, whereas controls have a sleep efficiency of 90%. Sleep efficiency is the measure of the time you are actually asleep divided by the time you're in bed, but actually not entirely asleep. So you will typically will be in bed longer but than you are actually sleeping. And we can see here that uh, with elite athletes, an efficiency of 80%, if it was uh, an eight hour night, that would mean uh, almost two hours of that time would be tossing in bed and not being asleep.
other aspects of sleep. And these are elite athletes with 11 years of training or more, and there were 600 athletes in this study. 80% reported poor sleep prior to an important competition for these reasons. Some of them get all caught up in thinking about the competition and they can't turn off their mind. Others get pre-competition nerves where they're just getting, their arousal is just going up. It, maybe they're in some certain amount of fear. Their arousal is going up and they don't know how to control that. Others are just in unfamiliar surroundings. I mean, if, if you travel all the time, being in a new hotel is pretty uneventful. You just, yeah, whatever, it's a hotel, there's a bed, good enough, and you go to sleep. But when you don't travel too often, hotel and tra uh, travel and hotel surroundings just add to the stress all the time. Uh, it's, I find it personally uh, mildly stressful, just traveling and being at airports and going through security and the lineups and all that hassle. So anyway, hotels themselves can add to issues. If a hotel is of poorer construction, uh, then noises and things like this get through the doors and the walls and the floors and ceilings, and that can wake you up at night. I always travel myself with earplugs, just for those reasons. But other things can also cause issues. You know, how stiff is the match? Is it too soft? Is it too hard? There's yeah, all kinds of new things that we just typically aren't as settled in a new surrounding, in a new bed and such as we are in the the same old bed we've been sleeping in for a long period of time. Anyway, 57%, we'll say pretty much six out of 10 uh, athletes believe that this poor sleep had no influence on their performance. And yet, over one quarter of them reported daytime sleepiness. 20% reported bad mood and 15% poor performance. Well, you know, if you have daytime sleepiness, and you have a bad mood, that is going to impair your performance, whether you recognize it or not. Here's some other sleep stats. Now in this case, poor or reduced sleep during training and during a competition produces these changes and in this order, and this is based on this study here. of Irritable or depressed mood was the most common emotional side effect in the athletes who are tired, but so is memory loss. And memory loss is, that's an important thing. You don't want to lose memory. You may need to remember all kinds of things like where the event is being hosted, procedures to getting there, where the lockers are, certain aspects about your competitors that might be an advantage for you to know and remember. And if you forget that, then you might, you might open yourself up to losing to them. Uh, loss of physical strength. Yeah, when we are tired, it is hard to maintain strength. And between increased clumsiness when we're tired and loss of strength, it's easier to have an injury. Now, this study here, there are actually two studies involved where these stats came from, and they showed that improving sleep also improves these attributes in athletes. Sprinting speed in basketball players improves. Kick strokes in basketball also improves. Improved sprint times and valid serves and hitting in tennis. Shuttle and dash times in football. So all these things improve when our sleep improves. Now let's talk a little bit about audiovisual entrainment and how this affects the body, mind, and the brain and so on. Well, these are the main attributes of entrainment that we know of today. Entrainment can adjust the frequency of your brain based on the stimulus frequency that we present through the uh, eye sets and the headphones. It can dissociate people, and that's probably one of the best aspects of entrainment. It dissociates people in a meditative sort of way and puts them into a real deep trance, which we call uh, DAR, dissociate and restabilize. In the process, of course, it calms the entire autonomic nervous system, and there's plenty of research on that. Entrainment also increases cerebral blood flow. Lactate and anaerobic ATP. These get shut down during stress and anxiety and actually will then impair performance. So entrainment drives that up. Balances neurotransmitters. Again, in fear states, neurotransmitters such as serotonin uh, drop low and norepinephrine, which is the brain's adrenaline, gets way overexpressed. And of course, that's a flight or fight type of response. 
So it balances those neurotransmitters, which also, if they get thrown off, will impair sleep and, uh, and add to tension and such and anxiety as well. Neuronal excitation and glia. So this is really important as well. If glia work well, our cognitive abilities improve, our vision improves, spatial abilities improve, making executive decisions improve. Everything improves when our glia improves. Heat shock protein increases. Heat shock protein is uh, important in all kinds of mental functioning, including uh, controlling inflammation in the brain and so on. The certain types of cytokines involved in inflammatory regulation also improve as well. Now you see I have some of these listed in yellow and some of these listed in blue. The ones in yellow I believe are the attributes or the aspects of entrainment, which I really think helps with the improvement of the performance itself. Those that are in blue also help with performance, but I think they play a larger role in helping recover from concussions. A lot of sports, of course, involve potential head injuries and you'd hate to get knocked offline because of concussion and lose your career in the process. And entrainment works remarkably well in the recovery of concussion. Here's a little aspect of entrainment. Person has all this clutter and thoughts and racy stuff going on in their head. They run a session on entrainment. Within a few minutes, that clutter and mental noise is settling down. Typically at about the six minute mark, the brain becomes amazingly calm. And to see more about this, uh, watch my lecture on the physiology of audiovisual entrainment. I get into a lot more detail on all these aspects and how they play out and why they are so important. This is really the first study done. It only involved visual entrainment. This was the brainwave synchronizer and it was uh, published by Kroger and Schneider. And what they had found is that they were with using the brainwave synchronizer, in this case, with only visual entrainment. I mean, the auditory adds a whole new dimension of effectiveness to it. But with visual alone, they could put people into a, a hypnotic trance within a five minute period. And we can see here that actually quite a few more people were in a deep trance than those who were in a, in a light trance. And that's, that's an important aspect of entrainment that really helps in improving performance. It works on heart rate variability. This here is a yoga instructor who's been teaching a breath work for many years, who thought she was quite good at it. So we just had her breathe on her own. And we, while we monitored here on, on a breath uh, monitoring system, in this case, this is the M-Wave Pro made by HeartMath. And we can see her breathing is not at all good. Take a look here. In that whole first few minutes, you can see her score here. This isn't, this isn't good breathing. And yet she thought that she was an accomplished, well-practiced breath worker and trainer. We put her on entrainment and the entrainment has a breathing cue. In this case, she was on the spectrum sets, and the spectrum sets, in this case, we were entraining her at an alpha frequency, but the lights change color to cue you when to breathe in and when to breathe out. We typically present pinks for a breathe in cue and blue green for a breathe out cue. And we set the ratios and the times for the client. So it's kind of optimal for where their breathing is. But I must say entrainment is so powerful at relaxing people. You don't have to be that exact at getting their inspiration and expiration and or hold patterns accurate because they will do quite well regardless. Anyway, we can see here when we put her on at 320, her breathing improved immensely very, very quickly. You can see it both in the raw where it got nice and smooth and rhythmic, except for a little artifactual glitch right here. And you can see it in her score. Uh, the M Wave PC suddenly saw that she was doing proper breath work as based on her heart rhythms and started giving her a good score. Entrainment has remarkable effects on concentration and memory. The purple bars are the treatment group, and one group got SMR beta entrainment, the other group got alpha. And here they're looking at a concentration measure and comparing them against the control group in green. And we can see here that 
both SMR beta and the alpha group had remarkable improvements in concentration. But as you would expect, SMR beta had better improvements at concentration than alpha did, though they both worked quite well. So yeah, if you have better concentration, you're gonna do better at your skill. This just makes sense. You're gonna focus better, you're gonna do better, and so on. Also, memory was improved tremendously. Take a look at here, when you look at, again at the controls, uh, between the first test and then the second test, there is often about uh, a two hour difference between the two tests. Controls were actually fatigued on the second test and their memory was impaired. So they did worse on their follow-up tests, whereas the entrainment group actually did better on their post-entrainment test of memory. And we can see here that both groups, SMR beta and alpha, did very well, but the alpha group did a little better with memory. And this has been demonstrated uh, throughout that alpha stimulation does seem to improve memory uh, quite well. And it's probably the best frequency you can use for memory improvements provided your concentration is there. Because if you can't pay attention, you're not gonna have much in the way of memory. You have to be able to pay attention first for your memory to uh, be of value. And so it's pretty easy to run an SMR beta session before you get into an event where you need to really have good concentration. Events like golf or chess or playing pool. I should mention we've even had professionals use entrainment to improve their own skill sets. But because a lot of my original research was all had to do with TMJ dysfunction and dental applications, uh, dentists had used it and said that after using entrainment, they could do better dental work faster. So of course, better work is always good. And if you're faster, you make more money. And you keep your patients also longer because of the fact that you did higher quality work. This is worry. Now, of course, worry is always a killer on peak performance. Nothing like worry can devastate your ability to perform. And worry also always ties into impaired sleep. So this here is a study on worry. This was done at the U of Texas in Austin. And they looked at a waiting list control. They looked at an expressive writing group where they wrote about their worries. A worry exposure group where they were given things that reminded them of their worry and in, in, in hopefully in an attempt to desensitize them. And then an entrainment group that just simply ran entrainment when they felt they had worries. And we can see here that the entrainment group was outperformed all the other groups for reducing worry in college. But because entrainment is so easy to use and effective and people feel it when they use it, which is also important because if you don't feel an effect of a therapy or a treatment, you just don't buy in and then you just quit using it. So it's important that we can feel that. And you can look at the weightless control. They didn't really didn't have any dropouts because they had nothing to do. But expressive writing, which is kind of difficult, had a high level of dropouts. The worry exposure group had a high level of dropouts and the entrainment group had the lowest number of dropouts. Now we do a visualization, which has been very useful over the last couple of decades and we call it the X-ray visualization, E-X-R-A-Y. And this can apply to any performer, whether you're a professional like a dentist trying to improve your dentistry or whether you're an athlete. And it also helps with fear-based athletes. So think of an event when your performance was absolutely exceptional. And again, for a fear-based athlete, that would be an event probably where they didn't have real strong competition and they just knew they could just clean up and so they performed beautifully and they were in a, a real strong positive performance cycle. Anyway, think of that event and then feel the exceptional feelings and thoughts you had during this event. Recall and relive those exceptional qualities with all your senses and feelings. A, allow those exceptional qualities from the exceptional event to fill your body and mind as you apply them to the new event you are about to become a part of. And then finally, say yes, as you see through your obstacles and feel your success in the upcoming event that you have just witnessed in your mind. We have a session on the David Devices 
which is ideal for an X-ray process and then the execution of the actual event. So I'll explain how this works. We see here at the onset that right around 10, there's a green and a yellow line. The green represents right side stimulation. The yellow line represents left side stimulation. They're offset a little bit because that generates a beat frequency between the left and right fields of your vision and of your ears. And that causes, this beat frequency is very dissociating. So the intent is, is that you will drift into a trance state very quickly where you will be hypnotizable. Now, while you're in that trance state, this is where we want you to start practicing the x-ray process and do self-hypnosis. So practice it through here. Now, sometimes people, by the time they're done, they may drift into sort of light sleep. So we want to speed them up now because whenever you're executing your, uh, your skill set, Again, whether you're doing dental work or whether you're playing tennis, football, or whatever it is, whenever you're executing your skill set, typically you're in a very alpha suppressed state. You're very alert, you're concentrating, you're focused, and you're on top of your game. So what we do here, you can see at the very top here, we've got a blue line and then a pink line and then a blue line. We switch our stimulation from being synchronized to being alternate, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, quickly. And then we speed up extremely fast, as you can see here from an alpha state, a slowed alpha state, really a alpha state, which is a, uh, a hypnagogic state. It's an alpha theta state. And we speed them up into beta, as we can see here, right here. And we alternate during that transition just to wake them up in case they have fallen asleep. Now in the state here is where you're gonna visualize the actual execution of your skill set, And so let's imagine that it's a tennis player. So a tennis player, you imagine that your opponent serves the ball, you anticipate where that ball is going to be. You're already in position when the ball gets there and you give that ball a good hard hit and you put it way in the far corner of the other side of your opponent's court. You clear the net just by an inch or a couple centimeters, and then your opponent is scrambling for that ball. Now you're anticipating what your opponent might do based on your memory of videos or things you've watched of your opponent, so you know kind of how they play. And you anticipate where they're going to return the ball. And hopefully then you will be in position when the ball is there, and then you, you strike that ball hard again, into the most strategic place to put it. Might be the other end of the court, but maybe you see your opponent is already running to the other corner of the court, so you shoot it back to the same corner they were just at. So they have to now stop and run back to get the ball. Anyway, you visualize the execution of the actual game while you're in this state of mind. Meanwhile, you're bringing in to this state of mind all the exceptional and positive performance cycle work you did during the x-ray process, but people have a tendency to get over aroused when they play. That's what we do when we're really on task and we're ready to go and then we get over aroused. So we're going to bring in now all this extremely deep, relaxed physical and state of mind into the execution side so that when you're doing this in real life, you will bring in that relaxation through conditioning. And the hope is then that you will stay calmer than your opponent and then therefore actually have a better game. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things we've done with entrainment over the years. This goes way back to 1988. Uh, Dr. Bob Ward was a sports psychologist who was using uh, the David systems, uh, the David Paradise systems, I think in those days with view hole eye sets and a fanny pack. So they would put the units in a fanny pack, they would turn on the device and away they'd go. And here's the write up about him. And it says 1988, the Dallas Cowboys sports psychologist, Bob Ward, began using one of these devices, the Davids, to help the football players visualize passing, kicking and other skills. He also placed Davids with the view holes into the eyelets of the players' fanny packs so they could run their cords to them to use when they went for their daily runs so they could receive audiovisual stimulation while running. Dr. Ward noted that the players ran further in less time when running with the David system. He believed that without the David, 
the players were performing with a mental protective mechanism from their conscious mind, which interfered with their intentions from doing a best run. In other words, at some point during their run, they developed thoughts that they had best slow down to avoid overexertion, even though they were much more capable. But we believe it's physically possible, actually limits our physical ability. This here was a, a study done. This is called the Big Ten Golf Tournament. This was done by Tom Hawes in 1989 and 90. Tom was working with a Northwestern golf team who were struggling and the game was being played at Minnesota. And so they weren't expected to do overly well during the tournament. However, Tom got onto the Northwestern team with audiovisual entrainment and visualization techniques like the x-ray and so on. And you can see here that in the process, over the four rounds, the Northwestern team had the largest reduction in strokes better than average. And so it showed that yes, entrainment definitely played a big role in their ability to win these tournaments. Rocky Thompson was, I, I believe, our first pro golfer. And Rocky had some issues. He was a fear-based golfer. He apparently practiced golf probably more than almost any other golfer in the uh, PGA realm, but he would get upset when he started to get a couple of bad shots and, and would start getting angry and would start hitting things with his clubs and, and sometimes have a, a bit of a little meltdown on the green, which of course never helped his game at all. So fortunately, uh, he got hooked up with uh, Tom Hawes and Tom Hawes got him on the entrainment and it made all the difference in the world. And here's what they had to say about this. Here we go. So let's take a look here. It said about 8.30 in the morning, Rocky Thompson plugged himself into a contraption called the Paradise Light Sound Machine for 30 minutes of chilling out prior to leaving for Nashua, Connecticut to protect a one-shot lead over Lee Trevino and Al Gieberger. And so later on, they went to say, Thompson just knew the gizmo worked. I call it the machine, he said in his Texas accent. You put the things over your ears, you put the glasses on, and you shut your eyes. There's lights in the glasses, and they flash white and blues and greens. Then you hear these sounds. If you're nervous or uptight at all, you just mellow right out. And that is how he managed to beat Lee Trevino and Giesberger in that golf tournament. Now, Thompson won a lot of golf games, but never first. He was always third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So he had much smaller cash prizes or smaller purses. And he made a living at it. But here, for the first time, he took first place. And oh, again, and against some very tough contenders. And treatment is used in bodybuilding and in fitness. Frank Zane is a three-time Mr. Olympia, and here he is featured in Muscle and Fitness. And he was using entrainment back in the 90s, and he said he could have more intense workouts. He had less lactic acid buildup, which is often tied to soreness and pain, and he had a faster recovery. And so he was a believer in entrainment, and he used all the time uh, before and after his workouts. Jay Pacenti trained Indy 500 race car drivers. And he did so on simulators. I mean, these are million dollar cars. And uh, these are young, young guys who are very skilled, mind you. They're very adrenaline pumped. Uh, they're prone to making judgment errors, perhaps, and impulsive errors. And, you know, and also you're just learning and things are going by very fast, of course, when you're racing. So they do as much training as they can on the simulators and hope that, of course, that it will transfer into real life on the racetrack. So what Jay had done is Jay was using entrainment, again, with view hole eye sets, and they were beyond the simulators while they were running the view hole eye sets. And typically he probably used, I think it was the sensory motor rhythm band in around 13, 14 Hertz. I know he used alpha at times too. He used different frequencies to some degree, depending on the person's arousal. If they were over aroused, then he's more likely to use alpha. And if they were under aroused, he was more likely to use SMR beta or just SMR and bring the arousal up some. 
and he could tune that arousal some, and as a result, they did better on the simulators and they learned faster. Christine Boudreaux, she was a speed skater, and uh, we, were, we were certainly excited to be working with her. She gave me a nice testimonial, and what happened to Christine is that she was tragically injured in an accident during competition. She tripped on the ice, and a skater behind her you know, tripped over her and embedded the, his skate into her thigh, and uh, she almost bled to death on the ice. And so, of course, a lot of fear as a result of that. And as a result, of course, she has tried many different styles of treatment, including flotation baths and so on. But one of the issues she has always had is that she visualizes people passing her because she, if she's at the back of the pack, then if she was to trip, there's no one going to run over her and potentially kill her. So it's a very justifiable fear-based behavior but you're not going to um, win any competitions by having that. So once she got on the entrainment, it just changed her from a fear-based visualization to uh, a performance-based visualization, or a success-based visualization. So she says here, I now use the David Paradise twice a day, once in the morning to get into a good start, and another in the evening, just before I begin training in order to give me the focus and energy I need. I also use it to help get rid of my negative thoughts and to visualize my courses for competition. I had my David when I went to Lilyhammer, but I was visualizing Sylvie Daigle and Natalie Lambert passing me. I recognized my error and I have corrected it. Now I see myself running and winning, said Christine. Now that's a Negative performance cycle turned into a positive performance cycle just by dissociating the fear out of one's mindset. This is Janice McCaffrey. She's a race walker, 1996. She says, thank you for the use of the David units as I prepare for the Olympics. Many a night it helped me relax and stop my mind from racing before I competed. In general, I feel more stable and relaxed about competing this year. I believe the unit and hypnoperipheral processing tapes really helped me tune in to how to put myself in a relaxed yet focused state of mind. Your support was greatly appreciated. Yes, we also use these often with hypnoperipheral processing. On well, those days, they were tapes. Now you download the uh, MP3 file, and uh, they're very cleverly done dual, dual induction Ericksonian hypnosis audio tracks, and uh, we do find that they're helpful, especially when used alongside entrainment. This is Holly Gerke, 1997, a race walker as well. She says, just a short note to tell you how much I appreciated the opportunity to use the David to prepare for the 96 Olympics this past year. The David helped me focus on a race plan and relax prior to competition. Before meeting with you and being introduced to your product, I found myself keyed up, tense, and nervous prior to competition, especially major events, such as the World Cup of Race Walk, or the Pan American Cup of Race Walk, or the Pan American Games, and the Commonwealth Games. Not only were these com competitions very hard to focus through, but the trials for each event were really taking their toll on not only mental preparation, but prep as well. Once I began using the David, not only did the competitions become easier to focus on, but my workouts and training also began to benefit. I recall one of my most interesting workouts as being a long training run where I used the David. Thanks to your innovative and creative technologies, who custom made a set of glasses I could actually see through while training. She goes on to say, my heart rate stayed down and my speed increased. Proof that your system worked. Thanks again for your support and encouragement. You have a unique system, which I hope my competition doesn't get their hands on. Okay, here's a little bit more here. Now this has to do with Matt Nickel, who was again was a, uh, a mental conditioning coach for a short period with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Unfortunately, they had falling out and, and parted ways uh, rather uh, short into his career with them. 
However, look at their goals against average before using the uh, David AVE. Wins and losses, they were 10 and 10. Now, after using David AVE, their wins were 40 and the losses were 22. The ratio went from 1 to 1.82. And uh, then, unfortunately, say they had a parting of ways. And so he took his gear with him, and the Toronto Maple Leafs did not win the Stanley Cup that year. This is Tim Adams. He was a conditioning coach with the Oakland Raiders. And what he has to say is, I believe completely in this technology, and I think if anyone is interested in improving their performance, let alone their potential, then they would seriously consider using this technology and capitalizing on Dave's insight. I have found no other means that can directly affect an individual's ability to control their emotional and physiological state as well as the David Paradise can. The immediate physiological and psychological response is remarkable. John Perna, 2017, he's a golfer. I have never experienced anything quite like the David Pal 36 with CES, which is cranioelectro stimulation. After just one 20 minute session, I experienced extreme tranquility and learned what focus really meant. After my first use, I shot my lowest round ever and a course record of 66 at my home course. Now, those are all great, great testimonials and I'm very proud to have those. However, there's one more aspect that I'm very, very proud of. And uh, this is my daughter, Krista and my wife, Nancy. And my daughter, Krista, would, she was always a competitive uh, young lady and uh, she liked to do her best in school, but she would get, I don't know if you'd call it academic jitters or not, but she had a hard time falling asleep a lot of nights just because she would get too wound up on her academics and her homework and trying to be the best and so on. And of course, this would interfere with her performance. So she used entrainment pretty much right from the moment she was in grade one and she used it all the way through college. She graduated actually as a speech pathologist through the University of Alberta. And in one of the courses, her practicum, her marks were so high, they were the highest ever awarded to a student at the University of Alberta. And say so they were so high that the professor had to get permission from the dean to award her those grades because they didn't want it to look like collusion. And so, yes, so that's what entrainment did for her. And my daughter definitely has uh, attested to it getting her, her high grades throughout her entire school career. This is Glenn Eller. Now, Glenn Eller was in uh, 2004 in Athens with 17th place. Now, one of our distributors got him onto uh, essentially what was a David Powell system a few months before the uh, Olympics in 2008 and at which time Glenn Eller got gold in trap shooting and again had attested to the fact that yes entrainment helped helped him get there I mean there certainly was a lot of practice that went into this it wasn't just entrainment only but it certainly helps a great deal this is Rick Craddy a swimmer and he's been using entrainment for some period of time as well. Uh, I'm going to read the section here in the uh, yellow. You can, you can read the rest, but he's a 57-year-old, and he's a real competitive swimmer. He lives in the uh, San Francisco area. And he says, in order to prepare myself mentally, I utilize my David device for several weeks leading up to an event. I would typically engage a meditation program, and while relaxed, would envision a successful race meaning I would be able to finish under my own power and not be rescued and fished out out of the water. Using the David AVE device allowed me to settle down and program my subconscious for a positive outcome. I was remarkably calm prior to the race, but once I hit the 60 degree water, the adrenaline took over and for a bit, I was out of sync. That feeling passed, and I believe the reason I was able to stay in the moment and not panic was because of the deep programming I had experienced with my David device. This is Marissa Ponich, and right now we are working with her. And we've been working with her for a few years now, and her standings have improved tremendously. This is what she has to say right here, but better yet, I happen to have 
a testimonial from her so we can hear her say it directly. And here we are. Hi, my name is Marissa Ponich and I'm a member of the Canadian National Team for Women's Sabre Fencing. I've been using audio visual entrainment for over four years now. After using it, I find that my mind feels sharp, focused, but also relaxed. It helps me get into the right mental state for performing well at competitions. I've also noticed that my overall performance has improved using AVE. I've achieved results such as gold at national championships, bronze at the Pan American Championships, uh, team silver at the Pan American cha Championships, and team bronze at the Pan American Games. When using AVE, I usually run my sessions the night before a competition, uh, right before I go to sleep. And then when I'm training, I like to sometimes run them midday, but also I like to run them when I go to sleep at night. Um, I would say that the sessions I like to use the most are the Meditate and the Brain Booster. Since having my QEEG with Dave done, I've been more aware of how my brain works and what sessions to use with the David Delight Pro. Um, I would say that it's definitely helped my performance overall. I've used microcurrent electrotherapy with my David Delight Pro to help me heal an ankle injury and a little bit with my knee injuries as well. And I've noticed that I was able to recover faster and perform better because of it. I've also used cranial electrical stimulation during my David Delight Pro sessions, and I find that it helps me get more into a relaxed state of mind. Using the David Delight Pro has not only helped me with sport performance, but it's helped me in my everyday life. I've been able to sleep better, I worry a lot less, I'm more focused at work, and I just feel more productive during the day. I think anyone and everyone could benefit from using the David Delight Pro. It's great to have something that can help with sleep, mood, focus, relaxation, and recovery all in one device. So there you have it. Um, a wonderful testimonial from Marissa. And we're working with her. We're cheering for her as she uh, moves up in her competitions at a higher and higher level all the time. Now, entrainment has other applications beyond just getting people performing better in their competitions. What about co post-competition issues? Depression is a major issue for all kinds of athletes post-competition and particularly post-career. Many athletes have been cut off from their family and friends for long periods of time. They're lonely and uh, they've just got their whole life focused on winning this event. And when the event's done, there's often a big crash. This happened with Catherine Garceau and some of her teammates and uh, they fell into deep depression. And in fact, Catherine uh, published a book on just that thing. Anyway, Catherine and some of her peers developed major depression following their win in synchronized swimming in Sydney, Australia in 2000. She developed a food craving and put on 100 pounds or 45 kilograms. Her use of AVE cleared her depression and got her back into healthy living. She's now as fit as she was during competition. So yes, so her life recovered as a result of entrainment with the depression. Now, there's other aspects to uh, entrainment. And one of the things are, what about concussions? I mean, there's plenty of physical activities uh, where concussion is a part of the activity. American football, heading in soccer, just collisions in soccer or, or European football in general, cross, hockey perhaps occasionally in basketball when two players collide. I've been collecting remarkable research on concussion, and it's amazing what is going on with concussion. One of the things about concussion is that most concussed athletes don't even show up on an MRI. So what is really going on in their brain if they have a concussion and it's moving to potentially towards chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is the severe stage of a concussion which basically mimics Alzheimer's. Well, I have a 90 minute webinar on this. Go to mindalive.com slash training slash webinars, and you can find my 90 minute video on concussions and how entrainment works to treat these. And it's remarkably fast, it's inexpensive, and it's very effective. So let's take a look at a case here. We're gonna be looking at a unique signature, and this is low voltage low to no alpha eyes closed activity whatsoever. 
and severe phase issues in several bands, but typically in delta and beta bands. Now, this is my colleague, uh, Rebecca Basham, or Becky, as we call her. And this is an NFL football player that she is treating in California uh, to help him recover from his concussions. She's working with some football players who are in very rough condition. They've lost their careers, they've lost their families, they have emotional outbursts, they're angry. They could be dangerous to themselves or to other people around them. They're highly unstable. And she stabilizes them immediately. In fact, she uses entrainment as triage. It's, it is that effective at stabilizing a concussion or a concussed person very, very quickly. Now, here she is also working with Joseph Maroon. Joseph Maroon was the neurosurgeon with the Pittsburgh Steelers, who was featured in the movie Concussion, who was saying that it probably wasn't real and not an issue. And now he's a believer and he fully supports uh, what we're doing with entrainment and he fully supports uh, Becky and her endeavors to help uh, these athletes recover from their concussions. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at a 16 year old. You don't have to be old to have a concussion and have it shut down your mind. This is a 16 year old male who had his third and most severe concussion two years ago, this is 2015. Two years before I, I saw him, which was in 2017. And I saw him in spring at that time. And the parents were really concerned. I, I saw him in uh, April or May and his, his grades were very poor despite the parents really working diligently with him trying to keep him up his study, rehearsing on things, giving him quizzes. Uh, he was probably gonna fail grade 11 uh, regardless. Anyway, he had his third concussion on the right side of his head, it was in his temporal lobe, and he quit hockey that day. The next 16 months at home were full of daily loud outbursts and at times violent episodes. While driving in the car on the highway one afternoon, for no reason, he punched his brother repeatedly in the head. He also had many aggressive attacks at home. There were broken walls outside and inside our home. And many of these outbursts happened after he played violent video games, after which he would snap and be angry for days. When he got his first concussion, he was an honors student at school. By his third concussion, he barely passed school. We received a few reports from teachers about irrational behavior. He had to apologize last year to a group of girls when he mentioned killing them. We went to three neurologists that are concussion specialists, also pediatric specialists at Stollery Hospital. His MRI showed no physical damage, but I can assure you his brain was shut down uh, regardless of what the MRI had to say. And this is a condition that I call a thalamocortical disconnect. It's low voltage, uh, no alpha and severe phase issues. I estimate that probably in the more severe conditions of this uh, thalamocortical disconnect, there are as many as 50 billion neurons not firing. And if you look at an alpha rhythm, which is typically 10 Hertz, you could be losing 500 billion action potentials a second, which is a lot of lost brain communication and brain activity which then just makes them struggle in all aspects. Behaviorally, there are other issues that go on as well. Every single case that I have seen with a thalamocortical disconnect, with the, with the low voltage EEG, the um, lack of eyes closed alpha, and the severe phase issues, they all had severe generalized anxiety. They all showed severe sleep disturbances. Most don't sleep past four hours a night, and typically it's not even good sleep. And their delta wave activity, proper delta wave activity gets shut down. So they cannot sleep properly. But surprisingly, another thing is that every single person shows the signature of obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. And this shows up as a slow, a slow wave hotspot down the center of the brain where the cingulate lies. And Every single one of them, yes, has an OCD signature. And every single one of my clients pretty much have been hoarders, counters, cutters, ritualists, anorexics, in this case, uh, committed or compassionate gamers and, and committed substance abusers. But they all obsess. And you'll see this coming up. 
So this is this uh, general, this young, this young man's signature. And we can see here, he is uh, severely low voltage everywhere, except he is making alpha on the back right hand side of his head at location O2, and a little bit at O1, but for the most part, his alpha is shut down. He is making delta waves right here, but those are not good delta waves at all. Those are concussed delta waves. And when I mentioned to his father that he was making alpha waves only in the back of his head, his father commented that was the only part of his head he hadn't hit yet. So take a look at a spectral array and you can see at the back of his head here, you see the alpha right here at the, at the back right hand side, a little bit on the back left. Otherwise his alpha is shut down, and I, which I call a thalamocortical disconnect because the alpha rhythm is established through a loop between the thalamus and the cortex. When that loop is interrupted, the rhythm stops. You also will see that they make high delta and theta activity as well. And this is a nice close condition, but the high delta and theta activity is really not proper, especially the delta. And that is why they can't sleep properly either. And in the process, which I'm not gonna get into it, but in the process it leads to either Alzheimer's or a CTE. Now here's an example of him, this is him here. And you can see here that he's got this pink spot showing up and it's highlighted here as well down his singlet. And that is the OCD signature. He's running very slow. And um, all this pink stuff down in this range reflects a, a real lack of ability to think and process information, make good executive decisions, like not to threaten to kill girls in school and stuff like this. And, uh, and real slowing. We see he's generally blue up here, which means his faster frequencies are kind of shut down. Now this is on the microvolt scale. This is not on the database at this point, just frequency processing of the microvolts themselves, which is a process called quantitative EEG on a magnitude measure. When we plug him into the database, as we see here, the database is looking to see 10 Hertz alpha because that's always a strong rhythm when we close our eyes. He doesn't make it. So it shows a real blue spot here, which is a coincident with minus two standard deviations. So that's the thalamocortical loop being shut down. And that's what you see there. We also see again on the database that his delta theta activity is extremely high. Here we are looking at his phase and overall his phase is better than most people's phase who have concussions. He's actually doing quite good. Here's his delta. We see some of his frontal area is knocked out with the rest of his brain. And some of his back area on vision is knocked out with the rest of his brain, but in the SMR band. But part of the reason why this does look knocked out is because it is the only part that is functioning. So it's the odd man out with the entire remainder of the brain that is not functioning. Sometimes you have to interpret these a little carefully when you're reading them. So this is on entrainment. Now we're using an SMR beta protocol that is also randomized and the randomizing is really important because it generates extremely complex stimulation. And that complex stimulation just hits the brain with so many combinations and permutations of stimulation that it excites the brain in all sorts of ways. And in some ways I think we don't entirely understand it yet. But one of the ways that it does get excited is through the activation of lactate and ATP. And the heat shock protein probably plays a role in it as well as increasing cerebral blood flow. Slow brainwave patterns like you saw there, they have very low cerebral blood flow. So when, as we stimulate the brain, the blood flow demands go up hugely. And so this is him now 20 minutes in, and what we're seeing is he's starting to show alpha activity all over the place, meaning Billions of neurons are getting back on board and they're firing in the thalamocortical loops again. Look at his spectral output now. He's got alpha waves all over. You can also see that his theta and delta activity has gone down greatly. So this, this brain is being activated. And during this process, when this happens, my, my clients most often comment that, whoa, the bag is off my head finally. Or, well, the fog has cleared, I can see again, I can think again. I feel like I'm on my feet again instead of floating around in a cloud. Uh, these are the types of comments that we get immediately. Also, because most of the people 
are sleep deprived because they can't sleep because they can't make proper delta waves either, uh, they will fall asleep on entrainment and they will sleep for half an hour after the entrainment is done and they will drive out large, large, large delta waves of sleep spindles the way they should be made when, when you sleep properly. We can see here now post stimulation, again, this is all in the, within the hour, and we can see his 10 hertz is now established. You see it right here. Before it wasn't, there was no alpha at all. And when we look at the database, instead of being a blue box here now, or a blue circle, it's now a very healthy looking circle, meaning his activity is really, really fired up well. Now we had him on an SMR beta, which is basically 14 hertz and 20 hertz stimulation. And we can see there's a little bit of 20 hertz activity that actually shows up in his EEG down below here. So sometimes you see some of the entrainment effects on the frequency level showing up. But most of the time with concussions, we're seeing the effects of entrainment that involve lactate, ATP, cerebral blood flow, heat shock protein, and other factors that really are playing out in the brains, getting kicked back into functioning once again. We can see his uh, face has improved. Now, T6 is the odd man out. The, all the rest of the brain, now remember O2 looked like it was the odd man out before in beta, but now it's running fine because the whole brain now is generating proper activity, so everything looks good. But T4 is still showing some signs from some beta knockout from that puck, that concussive in his temporal lobe there. Uh, but everything fired up in short order. It didn't take too many sessions and completely changed his life. Here he is here again. This is his another beta uh, phase measure and you can see how well he's doing. So anyway, he started using entrainment, let's say it was April, uh, maybe early May. School ended at the end of June and he passed. And as he used the entrainment, uh, this was the David uh, Delight uh, uh, device. And he used it throughout the summer and of course into the next year of grade 12. And his parents commented on follow-up that he was clear-headed, he could pay attention longer in class, his mood had improved actually greatly. And he was much more social instead of being a recluse and just hating everybody and yelling at everyone. He suddenly wanted to socialize and hang out with his parents, which just pleased them endlessly. There's nothing like you know connecting with your children. And parents really hurt when their children won't connect with them. His parents also are using entrainment, and the whole family can, and I recommended it. And so mom, uh, who does yoga, found that her balance improved, her mind is more relaxed, and she sleeps better when she uses the Alpha Theta session. The father finds that he is calmer, and he also sleeps better, and he uses Theta. Now, one more thing I should mention about this is that their son did so well in grade 12 that he qualified for a student exchange program and ended up spending three months in Germany. Now, how's that for a wonderful success story? This boy was on his way to prison, and now he's, uh, he's very successful. He's got a career. He's, gonna, he's guaranteed to have a good relationship. Yeah, and his life is definitely on track to being a wonderful life, which you would all want to dream for. Now, this is a testimonial from a, a semi-pro football player who had a concussion and used entrainment to uh, treat it. He said, my name is Shane Hale. I am a former University of Pittsburgh football player, and I just returned home from treatment at Pure Sports Recovery. Pure Sports Recovery is where Rebecca Basham works. He said, while at Pittsburgh, I played defensive end. I worked very closely with Rebecca Basham while at Pure, and she used the David Delight Plus and glasses as part of my treatment. I was very impressed with how the Delight Plus and glasses were able to help me both throughout the week, in the weekends and over the weekend when I was not in the office with Rebecca. Before using the device and glasses, I had a difficult time sleeping, focusing, and I struggled with headaches on a daily basis. Now, after treatment and use of the device and glasses, I am able to sleep soundly, focus on my work, and I have minimal to no headaches. I believe the Delight Plus has contributed to this great improvement. It's hard to imagine that you could have a device that would appear to be a panacea for all things related to peak performance. And most of the time, if someone was to say that, 
I would say, well, that's, that's a load of nonsense. But I'd been very skeptical about entrainment as well. However, over 40 years now of working with audiovisual entrainment, I've come to realize this technology is far more powerful than I ever could have imagined. And indeed, it can be used for pretty much all aspects of peak performance. Thank you very much for listening to this webinar. I wish you the very best. Stay well.